This file shows the various different examples of how to run a simulation study in R. My focus here is on, on the simulation part, not really on data generation part or analysis part. So what I'm doing in this file is just showing how you can simulate a simple data set, run a regression analysis, and do that with various levels of, of complexity and various levels of features. Let's take a look at the single sample simulation first. The idea of a single sample simulation is that you generate a single sample and then you analyze it in one or more ways. How this analysis works is that we first set the seed and uh, setting the seed relates to how computers produce random numbers. So computers don't really produce random numbers, but they produce something called pseudo random numbers. So the numbers that your computer generates from the random number generator are actually a part of a deterministic sequence that looks as if it was random. So the, the numbers are difficult to predict, but they are still deterministic. If we use the same seed, we will always get the same result. So if we run this analysis here, it generates some data, estimates regression model, and then prints out results, we can see that uh, we get the regression coefficient 0 0.998. And uh, if we run it without resetting the seed, we will get a different regression result. But if we set the seed again, we will always get the same result. So we can run this many, many times, how many times we like, and it always gives us the same result. Being able to reproduce simulations is important for a couple of reasons. First, if you're using simulations to develop practice problems for students, it is very useful that uh, when your students simulate the data set, they will get the exact same, da same data set that you use in your model answer. So the students can generate the data, then they can analyze the data, and they can compare against your model answer and see that they will get exactly the same result. The second reason is that sometimes you might get a result that is very interesting by chance only. Let's say that you will get a result that produces a non-convergent result in a structural equation model. If you want to learn how to troubleshoot non-convergent results or ask a colleague how to troubleshoot it, it is very important that, that you or they can reproduce the result. Whenever I talk with colleagues about methods, we sometimes uh, send these single sample simulations to each other to make the point. And uh, the point is only made if the analysis that my colleague sees is the same analysis that I see or the same result. So let's take a look at how this works. How it works, that we first set the seed again, <clears throat> then uh, we generate x. So we're just generating x from random normal data, and that's one variable. And then we generate y as a function of x plus some noise. So that is our, our y. And then we, we estimate regression and we summarize and that gives us 0 0.998, which is very close to the correct population value. If we want to try different recursion coefficients <coughs> or get a slightly smaller r square, we can either multiply x by, let's say, 0.3. So that will generate you a, a regression coefficient of 0.3, or roughly in the population. And then we can see that the regression coefficient here is uh, approximately correct. If we want to get the R square to a different value, let's say a smaller R square, but still the same regression coefficient of one, we can multiply this error variance by, let's say five, that will uh, decrease our R square quite a bit. So it was uh, 0 0.4 and now it's 0 0.03. So uh, you can modify the equation that generates the data to generate different kinds of populations. So that is our, our original model. So that is the single sample simulation. The next example is a simple Monte Carlo simulation. So this example here extends the single sample analysis by repeating the data generation and analysis a thousand times. 1000 is very common. If you have uh, something that runs a bit longer, then you might go with 500 or 200. But for most applications, 1000 is the standard. So why would we want to estimate one model or simulate one data set and estimate a model 1,000 times. The reason is that this allows us to study how a, a statistic or a, a analysis tool behaves in samples. 
So whenever we run something from a single, single sample, that estimate will always contain some estimates in there. So there's always some random noise. If we want to, for example, understand if our estimates are systematically biased, so there's systematic estimation error, not just random noise, then we have to repeat the estimation process many times. Another useful thing for, or useful way of using uh, this kind of uh, simple Monte Carlo is to do power analysis. So we might check how our statistic behaves or how our analysis behaves with varying sample sizes. So when we run this code here, it produces us um, a couple of things. First, it estimated us um, a thousand regression models and uh, the mean estimate is, is 1.0013. So it's unbiased because the population value here is, is one, we don't multiply x with anything. And we can see that the estimates are roughly normally distributed. They are actually exactly normal, but this more bumpiness is here because this is a, a finite number of, of, of samples that we estimate. If we would do this for, let's say, uh, a million times, then we, this would look a very smooth normal distribution. We can also see how this regression behaves if we have a larger sample size. So we can see that the estimates are mostly between 0 0.8 and 1.2. So what will happen if we multiply our sample size by, by 10? So if we collect 1,000 observations, we, we can run the, um, the study. Let's remember to set the seed. And then uh, we can see that, OK, it's again unbiased. So the biasness didn't really change with the sample size. But now most of the estimates are within 0 0.95 and 1.05 instead of 0 0.8 and 1.2. So we can see that the precision was uh, is a lot better when uh, we increase the sample size. If we want to see the replications, we can just print them here. So that is all the recursion coefficients that this code estimated. Let's return to the original values. There's one thing that beginners sometimes get it incorrectly, and it is where do you set the seed? And I've seen this um, a few times with someone who starts doing simulations. So it is an, an error to specify the seed here. You might think that it's useful to set the seed right before you ge start generating random data, because that's where you need the seed. But this has the problem that now the seed is defined inside the replication loop. That means that every single replication that we will run will use the same exact seed and it produces the same exact result. So we run this here and if we print the estimates, we can see that uh, we can see that every regression coefficient is the same. And that is of course not the idea. You want to estimate the, the statistic over 1,000 independent and different samples, not 1,000 times the same sample. So uh, we always set the seed outside the replication loop. The next example is simple Monte Carlo with parallel processing. In the previous example, the simulation ran very quickly because we just did two variables and we ran regression analysis and that is very quick to calculate for a computer. But not all models that you estimate are so quick. And uh, for example, if you do multi-level modeling, if you do generalized linear models, you do structural equation modeling, then one replication can take a few seconds to run and that quickly adds up when you don't do it a thousand times. For example, a simulation with structural equation model could take easily a few hours. You can actually speed that up, fortunately. And uh, how the speed up works is that normally when you run R code, it just runs on a single computer core. But for example, my computer here, which is M1 MacBook Pro, it has 10 computer cores. So I can actually uh, split the work, work in 10 different chunks and the computer runs those, each of those chunks at the same time. So I get almost tenfold increase in computation speed. If you have a bigger computer with more cores, you will get even more uh, speed up in your simulation. How this works is that we need to first choose a parallel processing framework. There are a couple for R, but the most modern and the most advanced and the easiest to use is the future framework. 
the idea of a future is that it creates code blocks that are executed sometime in the future so that it allows the computer to, uh, to proceed without actually running code. If you are interested more in the programming concept of futures, you can read more about it here on this, webs on this um, website. But for us, the important thing, uh, what we need to do, how we change the, uh, the previous example is that instead of running with replicate, we just do future replicate because these replications are independent then uh, we simply need to need to apply a function that splits them into different cores. We need to load the uh, the library future period apply, which has uh, futurized versions of the apply uh, functions, which replicate is one, and then we we set the plan. So the execution plan is multi-session, which will choose the most appropriate a multi-core framework depending on the computer's operating system. We don't need to worry about the, uh, the different ways we could set up multiple computers like, like sockets and processes and forking. This will just use whatever is the most appro appropriate for your computer. And if you're troubleshooting, you can use plan sequential to run everything in a sequence, in which case it's very easier to see where problems occur. When you run on multiple cores, then uh, getting error messages from a processor core that is not the main core can sometimes be a bit difficult to do. So then we uh, will set future seed equals true. That is the default for future replicate but it is not the default for every function that the future framework provides. And a future replicate, future seed here equals true, means that we are using a random number safe, uh, multi-core safe random number generation. It guarantees that the random numbers are not correlated between the cores. And it also guarantees that if we run this code on this computer again, then the results will be reproducible no matter what other workload the computer is running. So it guarantees us reproducibility and, and reproducibility and safe random numbers. If we don't use random number safe uh, or multi-core safe random number generation, then it might be that the, the, the processor cores get different random numbers depending on in which order they query the random number generator and then that would make us make our results uh, not reproducible. But this guarantees that they are reproducible. Other than that, this works ex exactly the same as before. So we run it and uh, we have the results here. They are now slightly different than before because we used uh, multi-core processing and multi-core random numbers. But if we run this same analysis again, we'll get the same results. So uh, when we run a multi-core with multi-core safe random numbers, they are not the same as the single core random numbers, but they are reproducible if we run the simulation again. If we were to run this on a different computer with different number of cores, then the result might not be the same. So what we need to do is to load the, uh, the actual package, the, the appropriate packages, set the plan for parallel processing, and then uh, change more replicate, future replicate, and uh, just to be sure we set the, uh, the, uh, the, the random number, the multi-core safe random number generation to be on. It's a default for this command, but it's usually a good idea to be explicit about important assumptions. The next example is a multiple Monte Carlo simulation using nested loops. What this code does is that instead of running the Monte Carlo, over one condition, it varies the conditions. So we are actually running a Monte Carlo simulation over nine different conditions. I'll run it first, and then we can take a look at what it actually does and how it does it. So it runs now a bit longer. The reason is that we are now running the Monte Carlo simulation nine different times. So we are varying the sample size from 100 to 500, 100, 200, 500. We are varying the population regression coefficient 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0 0.3. And this code runs all possible combinations from sample size and population regression coefficient. And it prints out the mean uh, regression coefficient. We can see here that regression coefficient is pretty much unbiased, regardless of the sample size or regardless of the population value. 
the standard error uh, or standard deviation of the estimates or values of estimates would of course differ between um, depending on these values, but we are not interested in a study regression, but how the mechanics of the simulation works. This is the simplest way to uh, produce uh, a multi multiple Monte Carlo. So we would have two nested loops. If you have just one condition, then you would uh, leave out the, the inner, inner loop, just have the outer loop. And uh, we will need to manage our results ourselves. So we'll start by ge generating uh, a simple, uh, an empty list here. And then whenever we replicate something, we will add the replications to the list. So this part here is the exact same as the Monte Carlo in the previous example, but we'll just run it uh, using the value of, of beta or B that comes from here and the value of N that comes from, from here. So we just vary B and M and then uh, we put the N and B there with the coefficient just to store the conditions. And uh, then we, we have a list. And when we print the list, the sim here, we can, we can take a look at what, what's in there. So the sim contains uh, a list. So it's a list of length of then. So let's do str sim to see uh, the structure a bit better. So we have a list of, of or actually list of nine because there are nine different conditions. And each condition contains uh, uh, three values times 1000. So we have three rows and 1000 columns. Each column corresponds to a risk. Uh, replication, the rows are, the first row is the n, the second row is the b, and the third row is the recursion coefficient. And when we uh, come here to the summarization, we first um, apply row means. So we calculate the mean of each row. Uh, the mean of sample size is simply the sample size. The mean of beta is simply the population beta or b. And then we get the mean of the estimate. And then we uh, use r bind to put all those estimates into one, one matrix or data frame that we print out. So uh, if we don't do the R bind, we just print that, we will get a list of the different rows. And then we, when we call R bind, then that puts all them together nicely in, in a matrix or data frame. So this is the simplest way of running uh, a multiple Monte Carlo or the simplest way of, of getting started. But this is not the ideal way for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, if you have many different design, many different uh, factors in your design, let's say if we have five different factors, we might vary number of predictors, we might vary R square, and we might vary the correlation between predictors in our simulation. So we would have five conditions uh, that we vary. Then you would have nested for loops five times and the code becomes harder to read. The second problem with this approach is that it's difficult to run subsets of this, this design. So if you just want to run a subset, you will have to edit the code. And uh, the subset always needs to be uh, defined in a way that is uh, a full factorial of, of a certain specific set of of values, for example, we can run a combination of sample size 100 beta 1.1 and sample size 500 beta 0.5. That wouldn't be possible in this kind of uh, setup. And the third is that this can be parallelized by by using uh, the replicate, the future apply the the future replicate, but that is inefficient. It's a lot more efficient computationally to run the different conditions on parallel. So instead of parallelizing the replications, we run the replicate the different conditions in parallel. To solve those problems, we need to have a bit of a different design. The next example is multiple Monte Carlo with the design matrix and parallel processing. So the code is here. And uh, how this code differs from the Monte Carlo with nested loops is that we, of course, obviously don't have the loops, but we have something else here. So we set up the parallel processing like we did before. And uh, remembering to use multi-core safe random numbers, then uh, this is new thing. So we have this design matrix. So the design matrix is uh, a data frame or a matrix that contains all the simulation designs that we run. If we print out the design matrix, 
we can see that there are nine designs. So we have three sample sizes, we have three regression coefficients, and uh, this is the, the full combination. All the combinations, so it's nine combinations. So why would this be more useful than running the for loops? Well, the first thing is that it's easy to run subsets. So if we want to run only, let's say, the uh, designs one, four, and seven, we can just subset like that. And uh, this would not be that easy with the for loop. And uh, for example, this would not be possible with a for loop. So it's not possible to run uh, a fractional factorial. So we would have the n equals 0.200 using a difference uh, regression coefficient and then others. So this, of course, would not be uh, very useful in this particular case. But in other cases, this is a very useful feature. For example, if you run structural equation models of varying complexity, you might want to uh, make sure that the most complex models are only run if sample size is, is 500 or more. So you might determine that, decide that some more complex simulations should only use a larger sample size. And that is in practice where I've used uh, fractional factorials, not running or, or leaving out some combinations uh, quite a lot. So this is the design matrix. And uh, then uh, the actual simulation code looks a bit different. So instead of uh, having the for loop, we have this future apply here. So the future apply is a parallel processing enabled version of the apply function. So what does the apply do? Well, apply applies a function over uh, margins of a factor or a data frame. So if I design matrix here, then we can apply something over rows one, columns two, or if it has more dimensions, then we could have like three or four, four or four or four dimensional data. But we could do one and then uh, let's just print. So what this does is that it prints out every row of the matrix. So uh, it's not particularly uh, interesting, but it just prints first row, then it prints the second row. Uh, we can also calculate summary statistics. So, so we can have, have a sum summary sum of every row. So this is the sum of n and beta. We can do the same for, for columns. If we have, have two, then it's columns. One is, is rows, two is columns. So apply can be used to apply uh, a function either on rows or columns of a matrix. And we use apply here or the parallel processing version of apply from the future package. And uh, we call each row a uh, design. So because it's each row in the simulation in the design matrix corresponds to one design, we call it a design. So this is the variable name that we use. And uh, the replication loop here is the same as before with a couple of uh, differences. So instead of using n or using using beta, we, we take the n from the current design, we take the b from the current design, and again n from the current design. And then we uh, return the, the design and then the actual coefficient that we estimate. So the design always contains n and beta. And um, we, we return the replications here. The reason why I have this additional return here instead of simply returning the, directly from the replicate is that this makes troubleshooting a bit easier. We also need to have a simplify equals false here. And the reason for not simplifying is that now we have a, a three-dimensional result object. So we will have, a, this is the, the statistic that we return. So there is the n, there's the beta, and then there's the estimate. So this is one dimension, it's the statistic. The second dimension is the replication. And then the third dimension here is the, the design. If we have simplify equals true, then future apply tries to simplify the result into a matrix. And in this case, the rows and columns uh, would be nine over 3000. So it just puts everything from those replications together, uh, including the beta, the n and the estimate in one 
one big vector instead of having a, a, a matrix that is three by one. So we don't want to simplify. We uh, simplify later ourselves. When we run it, we set the seed here, we run it and uh, it produces uh, the same result as before, but a lot faster. And uh, this is the probably the easiest way of running a Monte Carlo simulation over multiple different conditions using parallel processing. You could use a uh, future replicate here and just do you apply here, but that is less efficient computation. You always should uh, do the parallel processing on high, as high up as possible in, in your design because there are inefficiencies in, in starting a new process, for example. This is uh, a lot easier to parallel size than, than for loops because in for loops, you would have to decide on, on which level of a loop to uh, or which loop to parallelize. For example, I have 10 cores on this computer. And if we if we go up and we apply parallel programming to this outer loop, it means that we uh, split the simulation in, in three chunks. And uh, that would, would leave about 70% of the computer power on my computer underutilized because it's just running on three cores. This uh, allows you to run every design on a separate core. The next example is multiple Monte Carlo using the sim design package and parallel processing. So the code is here. And one of the big advantages in R is the availability of packages. Quite often when someone runs into a problem that they want to solve, then uh, they find out a solution that might be more general and then write a package about it. And uh, this is um, a package written by some R user for doing Monte Carlo simulations. It has been around uh, for a couple of years, but still uh, when developing uh, this uh, this example, I found a bug in, in the package. And the bug is that if we have beta here, and then we have beta in what we return, so I have a beta estimate here, then if, if this, if a beta here and beta here, then uh, the package uh, crashes with uninformative error message. Well, I hope that this is an isolated incident and I, and I reported the bug. Hopefully the maintainer will look into it and fix it. Typically a package that is actively maintained such as this, the, ma the maintainer will notice the error or the error report in a couple of days and typically fix it right away if it's not difficult to fix. This doesn't look like something that would be hard to fix, but it's just something that no one has tried before or happened to do before and then no one knew that anyone might use the same same name for an estimate and a population value. So let's take a look at what this code does. We are, oh, before that, let's talk about generally uh, the advantages of a package. And uh, the advantage of this package is that it provides you all the features that you might need when running a Monte Carlo simulation on your computer. So it provides you uh, multi-core processing using uh, parallel or future. We're using future because it's generally more modern and it provides us more features. Then uh, this provides us error handling. It provides us progress reports. For example, if we are, if we have a, a simulation when we are doing a thousand replications and then there is an error on the replication number 900, any of my codes before simply uh, throw away everything that's been calculated that far and return an error. This package uh, saves intermediate versions of the results. And if there is a crash, if there's an analysis error or data generation fails or something like that, it exits and then produces you everything that was uh, produced that far. So you actually uh, get results that you can analyze even if not every replication completes. Another thing that this uh, package does is that it uh, manages the random number generation. So it provides you features that allow you to rerun a specific replication. The idea of these pseudo random numbers is that they are a deterministic sequence. And if your problem occurs in a sample number 900, then uh, unless you specifically program your study to manage random numbers, you will have to generate every sample before the problematic one to be able to troubleshoot the problematic sample. This package provides you a way of 
restoring the random number generator state right before the problem occurs. So there are lots of convenience features. And if I would start now from the, from scratch running simulations in R, I would probably go with this package. But there are three downsides in a package. And, and one is the general downside of any package is that package always functions and uh, the functions have arguments. And that is something that you need to learn how to use. So if you know how to do a simulation using a replicate or future replicate and apply or future apply, then uh, you might not want to spend the time learning a new tool if you if your existing tools are good enough. And this applies to any any statistical package. Like many users uh, use SPSS, not because they think that it's the greatest software ever, but it's because that's what they know and this does the job. And even if there is a better tool available, they would not want to spend the time to learn it. So that's the first. The second is that if there's a problem with the package, like I found an, a bug in this package, then uh, troubleshooting that or, or even noticing that might be very difficult. In When I wrote, wrote a paper to, uh, to psychological methods, my, it's now under in the press about later interactions, we actually found that one of the packages that we applied generated multivariate or it did multivariate normality test incorrectly. So it is possible that packages have bugs and that might complicate your life. Then uh, the third uh, issue with using a package is that if the package doesn't do something that you want it to do, then it might be very difficult to uh, to modify the package or work around the limitations. For example, if I run a simulation on a computer cluster, which is like a, a rack of computers, there might be like 50 computers in a rack. And uh, I split my simulation on those 50 computers to run it faster. I might not only split on the design level, but I might also split uh, the replication. So instead of running uh, 1000 replications, I would run 10 uh, sets of 100 replications. And this software doesn't that easily allow that kind of replication. You, you can kind of work around it, but uh, it's not built into the package. Of course, this is something that most people who just run a simulations on their own computers wouldn't ever need. But those are the three three problems. But generally, this is a very, very promising tool for Monte Carlo simulations. So let's take a look at what the code does. And to get started with this package, we would use the sim functions. And, and this gives us a code template. So this is a very nice feature. So it just gives you the code. You copy paste that code into an R file and then start editing. And, and this is actually what I did here. So you can see that this, uh, I, I prefer to have lowercase, normally in my variable names, but I just use the, the templates. So, so, so nice. And then uh, we need to do a uh, sim clean if we want to have a clean slate simulation. So as I said, this simulation framework allows you to, uh, to recover estimates if you have uh, a simulation that produces errors or simulation that someone crashes, then uh, you can use whatever you got and continue from wherever you left off after you fixed the problem that caused the simulation to crash. We don't want to do that. So we will need to do sim clean, just clean every temporary files. We can see the temporary file appearing here in a moment when we start running the analysis. And uh, then we do uh, the design matrix. So this works the same way as, as my code. So uh, the design will, will contain uh, all the designs. So we have nine designs. This is a, a table instead of a, a matrix. So table is like a more modern version of a data frame. And um, this is built on, on the, the tidyverse functions instead of the base R. Then we have three functions. We have functions for generating data. So we have the condition, the experimental condition or simulation condition here as an argument. We have fixed objects. So if you want to uh, pass something, additional parameters, additional data sets to every function, so it goes there. And uh, then we have we must return a data frame. So this adds a bit of overhead. So this code is substantially low, slower than my code because of this overhead. But for any simulation of a meaningful complexity, when you actually run, for example, SCMs or multilevel models or, or GLMs that take longer to run, then the overhead would be inconsequential. So 
we have the generate function, then we have analyze function, which takes the data and then just runs the regression analysis. And uh, we have the NC, which is a uh, named concatenate. So you have to name, name this. And uh, then we have the summary function that calculates the, uh, the mean result. So we're just interested in that. And then when we run it, we will use uh, multi-core processing and uh, this will use multi-core safe random numbers. We will need to uh, set the seed. So we will set the seed uh, here and uh, we'll run it, see what happens. And it produces, it runs the nine designs. It gives us progress reports and it gives us how long it takes to run. And the total execution time was 4.8 seconds. We can also run without the, the future framework, just run on, on, on a single core. And when you run on a single core, it prints you the, uh, how long it takes to run each replication. And yeah, the execution time was 4.22 seconds because the execution time is, is calculating uh, the, the core time. So that means that when you're running two cores, then uh, it runs on uh, then then every every second of, of normal time is, is two seconds of computer time. So this is the the uh, the sim design. It's a very useful package for Monte Carlo simulations. The final example is code that is designed to run on a computer cluster. When you run on your own computer, you have the computational resources which your co computer provides. For example, I have 10 cores and then I can just use the, the future apply, for example. When you run on a cluster, then the computation is actually split over different computers. So a cluster is like a few racks of computers. There can be tens or hundreds of computers and uh, the computers tend to be more computationally focused. For example, the cluster where I run, run my simulation sometimes has computers uh, with more than a hundred cores each. So the core count on the computer is uh, in the order of thousands of times of more computational power than my work laptop. So it's like tens of thousands, of course. And uh, to run on a computer uh, cluster, we need to be able to run the, the simulation file itself in, in many different places, not just parallelize within the file, but run it on different computers. So just basically execute the same file started on a different computer. This would be useful also if you, for example, uh, if you don't have a cluster, but you could have a, a computer lab over the weekend. So if a computer lab has 30 computers, you could uh, split the work in 30 different ways or 30 different chunks, and then uh, have each of those computer lab computers run one chunk of the code and then combine at the end of the weekend. That'll uh, be uh, two months of computational time on a single computer. So what we do here is that we have the design matrix as before, then we have replications 1000 as before, but this time we are splitting the replications into replication sets. So we are not running 1000 replications, but instead we are running uh, 10 sets of 100 replications. So we need to have a, a way of keeping tracking which replication we are running on, on which computer. We also need to have maximum time. So when you are using a computer cluster or if you're running in a, in a computer lab, uh, you are not able to use that for forever. But it's like if you have a computer lab, you might need to be done by Monday when the classes in the computer lab start. In the cluster, you res reserve a certain amount of computational time. And if your job doesn't complete by that time, then uh, it's going to be killed. So we need to uh, monitor the execution time here. This is also a useful feature to have in your code. If you're running something on your computer and you want it to be done, let's say you, you want to run overnight and see how far you get, and then you want to, uh, then you uh, stop the simulation and then you work on the day. And then uh, once your work is over, you run the simulation where you left off. So uh, setting maximum execution time is useful there. Then we have, we are adding design numbers to the design matrix. So the design matrix is here. And when we add the design numbers, then uh, the design matrix just has the number. And this is useful for managing the workflow or the, uh, the jobs. 
then what we do is that we duplicate the design matrix. So instead of having one row for one design, we will have one row for one replication set. Yeah, I need to run that code too. Let's let's run it from the. So what we'll do is that we will duplicate rows. So now we have 90 rows and each of these 90 rows corresponds to our to one job on the cluster. So we could split this to 90 different cores now instead of just nine. And uh, then we do replication sets. So what we, we have here is that we have one to 1000 and we cut it into 10 equally sized sets. So if we have replication sets now, it is 10 sets of 100 replications each. So set number 10 is from 901 up to 1000. And uh, then we put it into their the replication. So now the design matrix that we have contains information about the designs and it contains the um, information about uh, what, what we're going to run in each design. So I'm just going to print the first, first row so we can see what it looks like. So design matrix first row. So we have that N, the beta, then the design number, and this is the replications. So when we run on each row of the design matrix, we'll run uh, the first row runs design number one, replications one to 100. The second row runs replications 101 to 200. So it splits the replications into these sets. Then we need to have a way of, for the R file to know which uh, set it runs. And uh, this file is designed so that it takes um, arguments. So whenever we run it on, on a computer cluster, or if we run it in a computer lab, the computer uh, has a job number. And the job number here varies between 1 and 90. So uh, the first computer gets 1, the second computer 2, and then the, uh, the job number is given in the arguments. And um, then we simply pick whatever is the job ID that we need to run, and we only run that on this computer. Then uh, we, we loop, we use apply instead of future apply, because on a computer cluster, the parallelization is handled by the cluster. You're not supposed to uh, to run on multiple core. So each, each job runs on, on single core, but all the jobs like 90 here would run on parallel. So parallelization is maintained by the cluster and not by by your code. We have a bit of uh, logging here. So if things fail, it's easy to uh, it's useful to see what was run. Then um, we we store the uh, we have uh, some management of of seeds. So we don't set the seed in the beginning of file. Instead of we set the seed based on the design number. And then uh, we set a seed for each replication. So uh, each replication has a fixed seed. This is uh, this guarantees reproducibility, and uh, in practice, it all it doesn't lead into correlated random numbers, so that's not guaranteed. Then we have a list that stores the replication results. Then we we loop over the replications. We we use a for loop because we want to keep track of what replication we are running, uh, instead of uh, when we do replicate, it, the replication does not know what its replication number is. But here we need to pass the replication number because we pick the seed based on the replication number. So we are. And then we have code for managing time. If the execution time is uh, over the limit, then it breaks and we just don't don't run any replications anymore. It just saves whatever was done that far, this far and stops running. And uh, we, we set the seed. We have a bit of logging here. Then we have generating data as we did before, estimating as we did before. And then we append the result list. We have the design number, we have the replication, we have the seed, and then we have the coefficient. In larger simulations, what I normally do is that I don't store the, uh, the, the, the simulation conditions. I just store the simulation number, and then I merge the simulation conditions using the simulation number or the design number. And then uh, we, we put everything together and then we save this on a file and we would we would then summarize uh, after using a, a, a different script. 
So whenever you uh, run on a cluster, you typically want to just dump everything on the on the file on the hard drive of the cluster and then just load it on a computer and summarize it there instead of summarized on the cluster so let's see what it does so we're going to run it and uh, from the beginning this will uh so it runs there's some some uh, logging and uh, it gives us the results it produced as files so it's each of these files contains the design and which replicates for that resign. So we have 90 different files. And if we were to run this on a computer cluster, one cl one computer or one core in that cluster would have handled one of these replications. This is probably not something that most people need to use. If you just uh, do things uh, for, for your own learning or for teaching, but if you end up doing something about methods that you would like to publish, and then uh, you want to run it a bit faster, then this is a very useful thing to know how to do. For example, I have a colleague who was running a big simulation on his work laptop, and he ended up carrying the laptop powered on for a couple of weeks with him so that he could run the simulation. But instead of uh, running the simulation on your comp on your home co work computer, you could run it on a cluster if your university has one in just a few minutes because they have so much more computer power than a normal laptop. So that is the final example, and I ho hope you find these uh, examples of how to organize simulations in R core useful.